he would look. So that's Saying I can't, I can't sign up and it won't take any of my. Um, let's do this. Sign in as me. I have two accounts.
Hi, everyone. We'll be getting started here in about five minutes. It's worse.
Well, it's six o'clock, so I think we're gonna start. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. The Ohio Innocence Project was founded in partnership with the University of Cincinnati College of Law in 2003. Since its founding, Ohio Innocence Project has freed over 30 Ohioans who served approximately 600 years for crimes they did not commit. OIP continues to devote itself to freeing people who are imprisoned for crimes they did not commit. A team of five lawyers and 20 law students investigate hundreds of claims each year. In addition, OIP advocates for legislation that reforms the criminal justice system to prevent wrongful convictions. OIP has been involved in major reform efforts, including SB 77, which in 2010 mandated police departments use best practices in witness interrogations, photo arrays, live lineups, and in collecting and preserving DNA evidence. More recently, OIP was instrumental in bipartisan efforts to reform the compensation system for people who have been wrongfully convicted. OIP's most recent effort on Capitol Square is a bill that would propose Ohio's law enforcement agents to record custodial interrogations. OIP's public education programs include work with professional organizations, community groups, and in high schools and colleges around the state. The largest education program is the OIPU network, including the chapter at the University of Dayton, as well as 10 other universities around the state. On behalf of OIP's Board of Advocates, staff and clients, thank you for joining us today and taking time to learn about wrongful convictions. If anyone has any questions, you can ask them in the chat at any point and they will be answered later. All right, without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to our policy coordinator and systems liaison, uh, Pierce Reed. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for this program tonight. As you've likely gathered, it's an election year. And whether you're going to turn this off and watch Fox News or MSNBC or no news at all, this is one of those opportunities where we can showcase what actually works in government. It's interesting that I think so many Americans want to believe in bipartisanship, but I think when things get as polarized as they are now, what we tend to say or what we tend to mean when we say bipartisanship is that we're gonna listen, but we're not going to really work in the spirit of compromising on both sides. Yet here in Ohio, there have been some wonderful examples of exactly what bipartisanship work can do. And we see that with our guest this evening, Representative Phil Plummer, who is a Republican from Montgomery County, and Representative Thomas West, who is a Democrat from up north in Stark County, which includes Canton and most of Massillon. The bill that we are here to talk about tonight is called House Bill 277. The bill would require for the first time in Ohio that law enforcement agents record custodial interrogations of people charged with most major felonies, things like sexual assault or um, murder. And I think for a lot of Ohioans, they're surprised to learn that that is not the state of the law right now. Especially for those of you who are in college now, you've grown up with the idea of uh, dashboard cams in police cruisers you're used to body cams on law enforcement agents' bodies as they go out and do the important work they do. But there's no requirement in Ohio law at the moment that when a law enforcement agent takes someone into the room to interrogate them about a crime, that there be any objective recording of the statements that are made during that interrogation. And this bill would require that that happen uniformly throughout the state of Ohio. By way of background, this bill was vetted extensively with frontline law enforcement agents more than a year ago. It actually goes back two years. And part of why we did that is because at the Ohio Innocence Project, we don't see law enforcement agents as our adversary. There are certainly people who work in police work that don't always do the right thing. But I'm a lawyer and I can tell you there are many lawyers who also don't always do the right thing. And we know that about every profession. 
So whatever the larger conversation that we're going to have as a society is, we need to be mindful that some people do not necessarily reflect all people. And part of the value of this bill is making sure that there aren't false claims of police misconduct against law enforcement agents. That's not in anybody's interest. If a police officer or a deputy sheriff does something wrong, that's one scenario that deserves to be addressed in a forthright public manner. But at the same time, when we see false claims of misconduct, that hurts all of us. And people working in the innocence movement don't see law enforcement agents as their adversaries. For everybody, the goal in the justice system is to make sure that people who do wrong things are held accountable for them. And part of why wrongful conviction work is so important is that when someone is in prison for a crime they did not commit, it means that the person who committed that crime is still out in the public. And we see in our own cases time and time again, particularly with sexual assault cases, that during that time that someone is wrongfully imprisoned, the person who committed the crime often goes on to commit other offenses. So regardless of what your perspective is, there's an angle in wrongful conviction that you should be supporting this work. But the other value of this bill is that it helps us prevent wrongful convictions. And it does that in a number of ways. The objective record helps everybody, including superior law enforcement officers, defense attorneys, prosecutors, judges, jurors, get a more accurate understanding of what exactly happened in that interrogation. And we know that there are a certain number of cases in which we are gonna have a false confession. A false confession is when somebody admits to a crime that they did not commit. And there are all kinds of reasons why that happens. For some people, it's fear of being held in custody even for a short time. For some people, there are issues with cognitive function where they can be manipulated into believing that they committed a crime that they didn't. And as you've seen in a case um, that was once known as the Central Park Five case, now considered the exonerated five, young people in particular are particularly vulnerable to wrongful conviction. In the law, we create adulthood arbitrarily at the age of 18. And there are all kinds of reasons why we have rules like that. But the reality is the human body continues to develop from the ages of 12 to about 24. From a medical perspective, that's what's considered adolescence. So even though many of you who are college students would not like to be called an adolescent, the reality is that the way the brain grows takes a long time and it's individual for each person. And until the front of the brain is fully developed, people are at risk for false confession. And the US Supreme Court has recognized this in all kinds of cases. It's the same understanding of brain science that has led the court to hold that you can't execute someone who committed the crime while they were a juvenile because a juvenile can't fully understand the consequences of their, of their particular act. So this bill, if enacted into law, would help us prevent all kinds of people from false confession, or if they do commit a false confession, it'll be easier to see that it was false more quickly than what we've seen in the past, which is where it takes years and years and years to establish that the confession was in part false. Our two representatives who co-sponsored this bill introduced it in the Ohio House of Representatives almost a year ago in October of 2019. And thanks to their leadership and their expertise, that bill passed the Ohio House of Representatives with a unanimous vote, 92 to zero in February of this year. 
There aren't many things that you see passing unanimously, but yet this bill did just that, in part because each representative brings their own particular expertise and credibility to the important conversations we've had in the General Assembly about why it's important to have that bill in place and enacted into law. As you know, Representative Plummer is a career law enforcement agent. Immediately before starting at the Ohio House of Representatives, he was the elected sheriff in Montgomery County. He was in that role for 10 years. But in the 20 years prior to that, he served the people of Montgomery County in a variety of other ways, including as a corrections officer, the personnel director, director for the sheriff's department, and as a frontline deputy himself. He has become a leader for the Republican caucus at the State House in a wide array of criminal justice reform measures. And he serves as the vice chair of the House Criminal Justice Committee. Representative West comes to us from a different perspective. He has a background in both business and mental health. He has a master's degree in clinical social work. That was my first career before I went to law school. So I root for him in particular, because just as I know that law enforcement agents have a very difficult job, our mental health professionals struggle with the same kinds of challenges that our frontline people do. And the work that our social workers and mental health professionals do is incredibly important to not just those individuals and their families, but to all of us in society. Representative West was also a devoted member to the Canton City Council. So he brings with us, with him, his background in business, mental health, and in the executive branch. I can see that he's with us this evening. So I wanna ask Representative West as we get started, if he could just explain to us what it was about this bill that drew his attention and why he's worked so hard to make sure it's enacted into law. Thank you, Pierce. It's so wonderful to see you. I tell you, it's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, as you said, we've been working on this bill since October of last year. Uh, so we still got a little bit of work to do. It's almost crossed the finish line. Uh, and we're, we plan on getting there this year, right? We certainly do. From your mouth to God's ears. There you go. There you go. Well, I, I reached out to Representative Coley today uh, of the um, Senate. And I, I said, what's going on? Hey, we got to get this bill moving. And he says, well, he's been talking to the president and we're going to get this thing moving. So I'm excited to hear that. And I just heard that today. So I wanted to get an update to see where we were at. But as he said, you know what, this bill brought a lot of attention to a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but when I first read the bill, um, I thought it was uh, definitely something that needed to happen. It seems like every other day we're seeing somebody being exonerated. Uh, whether it's here in Ohio or whether it's across the, the, the nation. Uh, and that has to stop. We have to get it right. Uh, and as I seen, I looked at this bill, I could see myself as, as an individual that may uh, end up in a situation where I'm being interrogated. Uh, am I laughing or is somebody looking at me? I'm just seeing everybody smiling and laughing. Was that... <laughs> I didn't know I was saying something funny, but um, no, anyway, to get what I'm thinking is uh, when I seen this bill, I just thought it would be the perfect bill. Now, this was prior to me even knowing about Central Park Five. I mean, I heard about it, but I didn't really know about it. Um, and it was funny because I was laying on the couch searching through Netflix and I, I stumbled upon this movie, uh, you know, that involved the Central Park Five. I uh, watched this movie and I said, wait a minute, that's the bill I just read. And it, lo and behold, um, I watched all, all of the series and the next thing you know, I'm even more passionate than I was when I first went into the bill. Uh, and it was a perfect timing for me because then it gave me a chance to really dive in to find out more detail about what was going on with wrongful convictions, uh, not just over across the state, but also here in the state of Ohio. 
So that's what really uh, drew me to it. My leader brought this to me and I thought it was a very good bill. Uh, and working with Rep Plummer, who is also a, um, uh, a, a professional in the criminal justice field. And with both of us working on criminal justice, we felt that we, could, we made a great partnership. And then of course, along working with Pierce and the other guys that were along with us, we had uh, a good team to really move this bill forward and make a difference in the lives of Ohioans and across the nation. Representative West, can you help people understand a little bit about why some groups of people are particularly prone to wrongful conviction? Whether that's people with cognitive um, issues, maybe disabilities, juveniles, as I so ineloquently explained them. Um, from your experience, both in the State House and in your former career. Yeah, and you know, all of us have different, um, how can I say it, pressure points, right, in our lives. We know what we can take and we know what we can't take. And I will say this, uh, and, and before I do that, I'm going to show you something real quick. One second. You see these guys? This is Yosef and Corey. Corey is in green. These are two of the Central Park Five individuals. After I dropped this bill, I had the opportunity of meeting both of them on the same week. And Corey played, um, Corey in his whole, when you seen him being interrogated by uh, the investigators, you could tell that Corey had something going on with him, some challenges, okay? And, you know, Corey couldn't understand or couldn't process the information that was being presented to him. And if you were a teenager or you're a younger person in your mind, only thing you're thinking about is I wanna eat, I wanna go home, I don't wanna be around these people. And you're in a blank room, kind of like some of you guys feel like you're in isolation, right? This COVID-19 got you at home and you're like, I wanna get out. These guys were in a room, a small room with nothing to eat, nothing to sleep. And it didn't take long for their cognitive uh, mindset to start to decline. And then you had this forced pressure of, of the PD or the investigators who is grilling him, who's putting things in his mind, who's telling them lies, okay? Who's telling them that your partner or your friend said this and that. And next thing you know, they take this as truth. And then they're starting to believe that this is actually happening. So you have individuals that are young. You have individuals that their mind, uh, their mental health isn't together. They may have uh, learning disabilities and things of that nature, those individuals most often are prone to confessing to something that they did not commit. And I can tell you what, when I seen, I did a little bit more research on, on this and learned that this could happen to anyone, even some of the most intelligent individuals. After a certain amount of time and a certain amount of lack of food and the pressure that comes on you and the number of lies that are presented, you start to feel some kind of way. And the only thing you're thinking of, let me free. And that's who we are by nature, right? We all want freedom. We all wanna be free from the situations that we're in. And there's no difference in, in this. And that's why I think this bill is so important as we look at, if you get into a situation and you get pulled over by the cops and you are now uh, being interrogated in some room you want that room, you want that whole experience to be videotaped, okay? Because they may lie, or you may have, they may say you did something or said something that you didn't do. And whose word are they gonna believe? You, or are they gonna believe the police? We've seen this play out so many different times, even in our community. When we look at all the different people who've died by gunshots or by, uh, by the police. Who do we normally side with? People of authority. So, or who are we gonna side with? A parent or a young person, right? That's traditionally what happens. So I hope I answered your question. No, you did. You did it wonderfully as well. I don't think Representative Plummer has joined us yet, but I wondered if, since the two of you have worked so closely, 
if you could address the issue of transparency, how that helps in terms of the public having confidence in what our law enforcement agents are doing? Yes, I love to. I love to. And it's the same thing in the age of uh, videotapes. And, you know, we love these things, right? These cell phones. Uh, you know, transparency is so important in this process because public trust depends on it. So when we hear something from an individual or when we see something, then we're more, more apt to trust in that process. So uh, transparency is huge. And I'll, I will also say this. Um, it's also important for the police officer because a lot of times what happens is the individual may have been wrong or the individual may have tried to hurt that police officer and that police officer or that detective or whoever it is, uh, is there to be protected as well. There are two individuals that are in the scenario, the victim and the officer, right? And the transparency is it works on both sides, whether that police officer uh, is telling the truth or whether that uh, suspect or that victim is, is telling the truth or their side. And then when this plays out in public view, then we get to see the real, the raw and the relevant, every detail of what happened. And then we can make uh, informed decisions based on what we've seen, uh, based on what we've heard, not based on someone's story at the time. And then you gotta also remember what happens is when you're in a situation like that, your anxiety is through the roof, whether you're the officer or whether you're the person that got pulled over, your anxiety automatically shoots. How many of you guys ever been pulled over? Just raise your hand. Okay. When you got pulled over, did your anxiety, did your nerves, did your heart start pumping? Did your blood start moving? You can say yes, or you're on, you're on mute. Okay, my point is this. That's the, that works in both sides. Your anxiety is high. And then sometimes what happens, your, your mind is going so fast that you forget some things. And maybe you may have changed the way something happened. And it's the same thing with officers, to recount what actually happened. That's very important, I think, in that process. So that's why it's important to have transparency in, in the process. Thank you, Representative West. I see that Representative Plummer is with us. Uh, Representative Plummer, I want to make sure that we give you equal opportunity because of your leadership and your experience in this area. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was about this bill that attracted you? as somebody who would be willing to sponsor it and lead the efforts through the house? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mr. Reed. Thanks for allowing me to speak to you guys. It's good seeing everybody. Sorry about my problems getting on with technical difficulties, but here we go. Yeah, I've had 30 years of law enforcement experience as a sheriff in Montgomery County for the past 10 years. So, you know, very familiar with law enforcement, police work, interactions with the public. So just always trying to make the profession a little bit better. And I also have another a professional police bill in the works that'll really help things out for us as well. So, you know, I've seen the pitfalls and I've seen the good and the bad in criminal justice and law enforcement. So one thing I figured we need to do with Representative West's help with this police recording bill is it's just transparency and it's fairness. You know, that way everything that's asked is recorded. Both sides have the recording. You know, there's no he said, she said. Um, it's just it's just fair for all parties. Um, you know, the accused has the right to have an attorney there and um, no games can be played this way. And, you know, sometimes games are played on both sides of the coin. So this just makes an equal playing field for everybody. Representative Plummer, I know you've been involved in a lot of the major criminal justice reform efforts at the State House, And one of the things that I think you're known for is your experience and being forthright and honest about it. You were once a frontline deputy, but then you moved into management. Can you give some insight about what it's like to try and lead a department of men and women and the pressures that they're under, including when they're taking an interrogation during a felony? 
Yeah, you know, leading the department, I had 450 officers. And typically police officers are an A-type personality because they have to be kind of bold. So you're dealing with 450 A-type personalities and it can be a challenge, but for the most part, they're good people trying to do the right thing. But the negative part is, you know, unfortunately they go from call to call to call and they just go worn out emotionally. And they get jaded and think everybody's a bad person when that's not true at all. So we try to tell them, you know, do other things, coach sporting teams, go to community events to see there are good people in this world and you just don't deal with negativity all the time because it wears you out. So that was a challenge keeping them all focused. You know, and I, I kind of went through that myself. It really wears you out going from domestic violence calls to assault calls to shootings. So you just got to keep them focused and keep them saying, you know, we're here for the right thing. We're here to serve people. And that's the most important thing they lack is remembering we're, we're here to serve, protect and serve, right? So that was the biggest challenge for me in law enforcement. Well, and everybody can make a mistake. There's no profession that's immune to it. And that's part of why I think people like me at the Ohio Innocence Project, we end up making everybody mad. Defense lawyers think we're second guessing them. Prosecutors think we're second guessing them. And the point isn't to lay blame. We all know that we make mistakes. Um, but none of us particularly like to admit it. Um, so can you address a little bit what the value is in having an objective recording from the police or law enforcement management perspective? Is there a way that that helps you better train deputies and frontline officers? Yeah, having a recording, you know, when you're being interrogated and you're in the court of law, words matter. So one or two words can make or break a person. You know, and if it's three in the morning, the deputy's got his notepad out and his pen, and he's trying to write down what you said, one or two words can really change the complexity of that investigation. So that's why myself and Representative West said, let's do this right. Everything's recorded. We all hear the same thing. The officer asked and the suspect said, the prosecutors get the same material and let it be played out in front of a judge. You know, some, some problems we have is when people get pulled over, they want to debate the situation with the officer on the street. No, just be professional. Let the officer do what he has to do, and you can work it out in court with the judge. You know, the officer has his his opinion on how the stop went, and you have yours. And that's why we have the judge, the middle person, you know, making the decision. So we just need to let our let our society know. Be courteous, be cooperative, and let the judge figure it out. For both of you. Um, about half of the states in the federal government have similar laws in place, either as a result of their legislatures or as a result of court decisions. Uh, I think Ohio would become the 25th state to enact this law. Indiana and Michigan both already have it. Can you help the audience understand what it's like for you as a representative when you're working with your colleagues to garner support for this bill, um, either concerns that some of your colleagues may have had or uh, the things that they particularly liked about the bill. You both come from different parties in different parts of the state, but I wonder if there's differences in what you hear from other members of the House. Uh, yeah, I could start. Um, yeah, I think when most, uh, as a Democrat, I could say this, you know, we have been fighting for criminal justice reform for quite some time. Uh, and I think this bill here is, is one of those bills that uh, hits at the heart of it, okay? Uh, because if we are able to stop, start, you know, really put those individuals in jail that really need to be in jail, the ones that have most uh, most violent, you know, criminal offenses, uh, then you're barking up our tree, if you know what I'm saying. I, we really, um, my colleagues supported this bill uh, without any problem. As a matter of fact, I, I, I think the only people that we had struggles with, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Rep, is the prosecutors uh, that I've heard of. Um, 
you know, this, this, is, this was brought forward, I believe, before by, um, what is his name, uh, Representative Sykes. I know he's a big supporter of this, but um, I'll let my colleague tell, tell you about his side of the aisle. Yeah, good, good points, Rep. Um, typically, the Republicans are tough on crime stance, but I haven't had one negative comment from my side of the aisle either because we all want to be fair and transparent. And like Rep. West said, you know, if you're going to commit a crime, we're all about you doing your time. But we want you to do your time, and then we want you to get out. We're going to help you expunge your record and clean your record up so you can get back on your feet and get in the workforce instead of dragging, you know, criminal records through the rest of your life. That's, that's what we're working on now also you know do your crime do your time learn your lesson and let's move on and hopefully you won't commit the same crime or another crime and you've given a second chance in life but i think everybody is into this bill because it's, it's fair and you know we all we all want to play by the same rules you know i think the and let me just say this also you know i can't thank the innocent project enough uh and i say that because you know even before the, there was this bill there was the Innocent Project really believing in uh, a lot of individuals that was wrongly convicted. You know, the state of Ohio should, all the state of Ohio should want to get it right. When we talk about locking someone up and taking, a, throwing away the key, you know, yeah, we all want to be tough on crime, but the reality is at the end of the day, individuals that, you know, are innocent, really need to be heard, need to be going through a process of transparency, and we got to do everything we can to get it right. Uh, whatever, what, whoever you are, or whatever side you're on, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're blocking up the most violent criminals versus those that are, you know, nonviolent. One of the things I think that people overlook as well is the huge impact that wrongful convictions have, not just on the people who are wrongfully convicted, but on the victims of the crimes that uh, were harmed in the actual crime. And then the secondary victims, which include the people who are wrongfully convicted, those both groups of people have children, they have families, they have communities. And then sometimes there's litigation afterwards, either through Ohio's compensatory scheme for people who have been wrongfully convicted or through federal civil rights actions, all of which end up taking dollars from taxpayers to um, try to remedy in some small way uh, the suffering that those people and their families have gone through. But have either of you heard much conversation about how wrongful convictions impact the original crime victims? It seems to me that that group is often overlooked in this process. Even at the Innocence Project, the Ohio Innocence Project, as happy as we are when somebody who was wrongfully convicted goes free, um, I often have uh, a difficult day those days because I know that there's a real victim of a real crime and some of these are the most horrific crimes that you can imagine. Rape, murder, horrible assaults that an officer, deputy, or a prosecutor is going to their house to tell them, sorry, we got the wrong person. Uh, but I think in so many of those cases there aren't services for them. There's not a great opportunity for retrying the someone if the proper suspect is found. Do those kinds of considerations um, go through the caucuses when you're thinking about wrongful conviction bills? Yeah, wrong, wrongful convictions, I haven't really given much thought on the actual victim and I'm sure I'm sure there'll be a lot, a lot of excitement there knowing number one, the wrong person went to prison and number two, the person who committed the crime was never held accountable. And then of course that person is still out there in the street. So there's still fear that, you know, this may happen again. You know, it's such a tragedy if somebody's convicted of a crime they did not commit and they should be compensated for the loss of time in their life and you know, loss of revenue, their kids seems. I, I'm really 
would like to push that. They should be compensated properly. But I haven't really thought about the victim side of it. That's an interesting question. Yeah, and, and me neither. Actually, I haven't thought about it, but I can tell you just, just based on what you said, I, I mean, I can see and I can empathize with, with the person who thought that the, they, they had the person who committed this crime. And then now all, the, all of a sudden he is innocent of our, all charges. And I think that's the other part of this is that when someone is convicted, sometimes we rush to judgment just so we can get a verdict so that the individual feels okay or the victim feels like, okay, uh, I got some justice. And only years later to find out I never did get the justice. I got the wrong person. And the emotion that would go, you know, around that I can only, you know, just imagine um, what that person is going through. But also, the family that, that has been torn apart because of their loved one being sent to jail or the one that's been wrongly convicted and then now him coming back into their lives uh, and the uh, things that come about a, a lot of trauma that may even be you know, impacted with that whole family um, and that network of family, if you will. Um, on both sides, you would see so much um, you know, trauma, if you will. I can't use a better word, uh, from that individual now being exonerated. Um, yeah, there's happy, there's joy, but can you imagine that person coming home now being institutionalized and, you know, having certain things in his life and now he's come to a world or she came to a world that is so different than when he or she went in. Uh, you know, some people went in before the microwave created, before this iPhone, they were still using the phone on the wall. Could you imagine their world coming back home to all of these new things and then these new way of lives and now their kids looking at them a little different because they were in jail all these times and their kid now needs to look at them and um, this person they thought they were hating or, or upset with, now they see that he was wrongly convicted and changing those emotions there's so much that goes on in this, and I'm not even certain that there's, we have looked at the mental health aspect of helping these individuals or providing a support network for these individuals once they come home. Um, so, you know, those are things to think about. I'm glad you brought that question up, and I'm sure, uh, you know, that will uh, be something that we can look at here in the near future. When I need to do a better job of making sure all of you have information, including about how this impacts victims. So that's on me, not both of you. You have plenty of other work to do as well. But let me also say to all of these students, it looks like there's a lot of students on 149 or something like that. If you look at uh, all of you, all of you have bright minds. You know, you always you bring something to the table. You have a unique perspective. And I would say, always reach out to your legislator if you have an idea of how we can do things better, not just within this system, but within all the systems. We all have to live in this nation, and, and uh, I don't know where all of you come from, but uh, I would say that wherever you are, reach out to your legislature, reach out to those people in power that are making decisions. And that's how our concepts come to reality. You know, I wouldn't have been on this if I had not been approached about this by someone else, you know, and as people bring me concepts and ideas or problems, then we're here to find those solutions. And then we bring it before a body of 99 individuals and we try to get that idea in, in, uh, into law, right, or create it into law. So, and it could come from one of you on, on this um, Zoom call. So... I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry, Piers. No, you can interrupt me anytime you want. <laughs> the other thing, though, I just want to say on that point is that both Representative West and Representative Plummer have two of the best legislative aides anywhere in Capitol Square. Um, I would not affirmatively lie. I will keep my mouth shut and uh, not correct things, but I wouldn't go out of my way to flatter someone if it wasn't sincere. Uh, for Representative Plummer, Ryan Quinn was involved in this bill from the very, very beginning. 
and working so closely with him, I know how committed he is, but also how smart he is. And although I've only got to know Sean more recently, I know he's newer to your office, Representative West. He's just an excellent um, legislative aide and another wonderful asset, both to you and to the people of Ohio. So for those of you who are students, I know that there's a lot of stress about not just school, but jobs after school. And one of the places I think you can make the most difference is uh, working for an elected official, particularly in the Ohio House or the Ohio uh, Senate. I think people tend to think about the federal government first, but I think you can have a huge impact, probably a bigger impact right here in Ohio. So if you ever have the opportunity to uh, visit not just your elected officials, but also their staff members, you'd be incredibly well served. They are the people who help make the wheels go round. And there are a lot of wheels going round at any point. So please make sure you're thinking about that as a career opportunity. I want to make sure that we have some time for uh, questions from anybody in the audience. Um, you can uh, send those in chat and we'll get to them. But I think that Claudia and Laura have been collecting them. Claudia, do you have any questions that have been asked so far? I don't have any from the chat currently. <gasps> let, me, uh, let me say this real quick too about your point, Pierce. Um, there is, and I've had now four aides uh, total. Um, my first aide stayed with me for a year and he went back and got his master's degree. We stay in communication even to this day. Before I jumped on this call, he texted. Uh, the second aide I had was um, a young man who only worked for me a brief period of time, and then he got snatched up by the Congressional Black Caucus in, in the Congress, uh, Tony Bishop, who is now back, and now he's leading the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus. He's the executive director. And these are students that came out of school and started working in the legislature. Then I had Carla. Carla stayed for with me for about a year and maybe a little longer. And then she now is the health policy. She's doing health policy in, at the Senate. Uh, so all of them immediately climbed. They all grew. And then now I have Sean and Sean is A1. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind he'll end up going somewhere big too. So uh, to, to Pierce's point, um, the legislature is a place not only to start, but it's also a place to grow. Um, so, yeah, I do uh, also encourage you to uh, reach out to the legislature, or you can also become a, um, not just a legislative aide, but you can also do your internships there and things of that nature, just to get a taste of what um, pol policy is about. And just remember, if you're in healthcare, if you're in criminal justice, if you're in social work, whatever field you're in, believe me, we talk, we talk about all topics uh, at the legislature and you would be involved in all topics. So um, yeah, I just wanted to put, put that out there on the table. Here's, Representative, uh, can I, I'm sorry, can I jump in for just a second? Please. Uh, I just wanted to make a point. I'm not sure if this was emphasized enough earlier. Um, I know it was definitely expressed that recording custodial interrogations protect everybody involved, and I think that's essential. But it's not just protection against intentional misconduct. I think it's important to think about some of the factors that contribute to false confessions that can be rather subtle, and it could be completely unintentional, where an officer in, yeah, again, everyone's exhausted, and maybe this is a long interrogation, maybe an officer mentions facts of the case and then that becomes incorporated in the suspect's memory. And then if the suspect gets worn down and confesses, then that, that suspect will include information that seems like guilty knowledge that only the true perpetrator would know from having been there. But the officer maybe didn't remember having mentioned that an hour ago and swears that this was independent guilty knowledge from the suspect. So I think if we don't have that record, we have to rely on fallible human memories and nobody wants that. 
Right. So I just didn't want this to be an adversarial who's telling the truth. Somebody's lying. Somebody's intentionally engaging in misconduct or you know trying to uh, mislead people. I think this is just the reality of human memory and just to underscore the need for recording, even when everybody is doing their absolute best to be above board. Very true. Hey, Dr. Dr. Barry, um, could you also elaborate on the bias that may occur? <laughs> um, there are lots of different types of bias, for sure. Um, I mean, again, we're all human. We have expectations, and so we can unintentionally engage in confirmation bias. You know, we can interpret things in a manner that's consistent with what we already believe to be true, and we will remember it and then report it to others in that fashion, even if that's not actually what was expressed. So I think there's just this whole, you know, bias snowball that's potentially at work here, and all these things can come together. Um, and again, even when everyone's trying their best to be above board and be ethical and do a good, competent job, we're still humans. And so we have those cognitive limitations, those heuristics we rely on, those biases that will get us, and we don't even realize it. So I don't want anyone to think this is an attack on anyone's profession or that we're accusing law enforcement of, you know, <laughs> improper behavior um, or, or incompetence or anything like that. It's just, let's acknowledge the reality of human information processing and let's protect everybody involved by preserving the evidence. Those are very good points. Here, so we have a lot of questions that are coming in. Um, what if the person being questioned says they don't want to be recorded? Then by all means, they don't have to. Okay. And then um, to what extent will the passing of the bill impact the way in which federal law enforcement interrogate individuals? It won't have direct impact on the federal government's law enforcement agents because this is a state law. The federal government actually, at least the FBI and the Drug Enforcement Administration, already have policies in place where they record interrogations. So in some ways, we're catching up with those federal law enforcement agents. Yeah, so the United States Department of Justice issued a policy in 2014 for all federal law enforcement agencies to record interrogations for individual suspects of any federal crime. Great. And then um, for the representatives, what's the daily life of your profession like? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let Helen I'll start with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it depends on which day, and it depends on <laughs> if you want to work hard or not. There's some people that do very little, and there's some people like myself and Rep. West who work really hard. So I'll tell you, being a sheriff is a very busy job, and this job is just as busy. So, you know, you have a lot of meetings, you have a lot of constituent um, complaints that you have to handle back home. Um, my police profession, professional conduct bill, I've done 15 town hall meetings across the state of Ohio. So I've traveled a lot. I've listened to a lot of opinions on it, including police managers and union personnel to come up with a consensus on what's the best policy to change the culture of policing. So something like that has taken a tremendous amount of time. So if you really wanna do your job properly and get everybody's opinion, which we should do, and even reach across the aisle like myself and Rep West do and get both R's and D's to the table. Um, there's a lot that goes into this job, but it's really enjoyable and we're making, we're making good progress. You know, and I think uh, what I would have to add, you know, being a social worker, I've always had my hands on a lot of things, okay? And um, being a legislature, I'm on so many different committees, uh, workforce transformation, health, uh, aging, uh, so I'm on a lot of different things, and so my interests are pretty broad. Uh, <clears throat> so you have, I'll, I'll put it this way, I'm going to take you back old school. Are you guys familiar with the tree shaker? Back in the day, there was a tree shaker, and they would shake the tree. All the fruit would fall, and then, of course, the fruit would fall, and then people would come and gather the fruit. So you need a tree shaker, okay? 
there are individuals that go and pluck fruit and then there's the shakers. I'm the shaker. So my, my day consists of a lot of things. Uh, so I get my hands involved in a lot of things. Right now I'm involved with helping uh, the minority women-owned business, veteran businesses to really uplift them um, through a program that was created here in Stark County as a pilot project. We were able to get money in the budget to start this and hopefully we can expand it statewide. Uh, I got in my hands in a project called the Navigator Program, helping those individuals that are impoverished and those individuals are unemployed to try to help them get uh, through, uh, through the employment process and get a job, uh, but not just get them to a job, but through a job. So oftentimes when people get a job, then it seems like all hell breaks loose. You know, the, uh, your car breaks down, you can't find a babysitter, all of these different things. Well, we put a, uh, we got some money at the state level uh, through Ohio Department of Job and Family Services to start a pilot project with our Urban League. So I've been working on that and connecting all these agencies to the pots of money at the state. That's, the, that's my social work part of it, right? Then you have your policy. Uh, and right now we work on 18 bills and the best thing is, is to keep working those bills, keep calling the people and allow, I mean, asking them, you know, can you get a hearing on your bill? You're always constantly trying to push those bills through to get through the finish line. If you don't get them through the finish line, you have to start all over again the next GA. So that's why it's so important to work, not just introduce bills, but to work the bills that you do introduce so that they do become law. Great. Representative Plummer, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, the cool thing about the job is we get to learn as we go also. So, you know, criminal justice, I, I can do very well, but I also get to learn about the other stuff. I'm on the health committee, the finance committee, so you get to learn about the state budget. And I've just been added to the energy committee. So probably like, like a lot of you guys, you know, I know about energy, you turn the light switch on and the lights come on and you turn it off, they go off. So I get to learn about energy now. Um, it's, so it's very cool, the amount of stuff we get to learn, but it also comes with time to do the research on to learn about nuclear energy, wind and solar, coal plants. So it's a pretty cool job, actually. If you guys ever think about doing it, I would highly recommend it. I was wondering how you got that Afro. That's how, the energy. <laughs> you guys are like the best combination since Lethal Weapon, you know, Danny Glover and Mel Gibson. It's like, you're the new guys for that. Um, Laura, are there any other questions? Yeah, we have quite a few still. Um, yeah. Someone asked how to get more information for ways to inter interact with the Innocence Project. Um, you can contact Dr. Barry, Claudio, or myself through UD email. Uh, we're also on Facebook, both the Innocence Project as well as our chapters on Facebook. So you can follow us there. And if you send us an email, we'll be happy to to get you more involved and make sure you're aware of all the events. Um, okay. and then, Can sorry. I just add to that real quick, Laura? Dr. Barry referenced some really important material earlier about what we call human factors and wrongful conviction. Part of that is it's critical to understand that most wrongful convictions don't happen because somebody intentionally tried to create a wrongful conviction. The vast majority of them happen because we make mistakes, including things like implicit bias, malleable memory, eyewitness identification errors. And you can get more information about all of those uh, different aspects of human factors through the Ohio Innocence Project uh, webpage. If you go to the Ohio Innocence Project, which is part of the University of Cincinnati College of Law, and when you get to the main page, scroll down to you see educational resources. You will find seven videos by international experts. Each one of those videos is short and you can use them for free. You can find them on YouTube. They're great for just better understanding a little bit about a very complex dynamic, but they're also particularly helpful for students, for classroom presentations, for papers. It'll give you um, a good visual aid 
and it's easier to cite than Cliff's Notes or Wikipedia. You can get away with it. So uh, please feel free to use any of those resources. They're all free and they were meant to be used for that. Could you remind me of uh, where the student body comes from? Is it Cincinnati or Dayton? Where, where? This is housed at the University of Dayton which has a wonderful chapter uh, through OIP. We have a network of college students, faculty and staff members on 11 colleges and universities around the state. John Carroll, Ohio University, Shawnee State, The Ohio State University, uh, Tiffin, Miami, Dayton, Xavier. Um, but it's important to give particular respect to Dayton. They are the OG of OIPU. Dr. Barry um, has led that chapter with the assistance of people like Laura and Claudia from the very beginning. Uh, UD, OU, and John Carroll were at the forefront and they continue to be some of our uh, best chapters. I want to say too about Dr. Barry. She's a psychologist and a faculty member at UD, where she's been for many years and really devotes herself to teaching and the well being of her students. But she also is a recent graduate of the University of Cincinnati College of Law. She participated in her second year as one of the legal fellows in the OIP clinic. And despite the fact that the bar exam is looming, she's taking time out of her uh, very difficult life at the moment to be with us tonight. So I really want to thank Dr. Barry, Claudia, and Laura for all the work that they do, not just tonight, but uh, year in, year out on these projects. Here's now you're talking, Dayton's my hometown. Go, go I know Flyers. That. Go Flyers. I was going to say, go Flyers. Flyers. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for that, Pierce. It's all true. <laughs> I know, or you just not speak. <laughs> right, exactly. Do we have time for one last question? Um, yeah, do we have time for maybe two? There's a couple really good ones. Um, why is it that just now we're thinking about interrogations being recorded? It seems that this is something we should have already been doing at all the police stations, FBI offices, et cetera. You know, I can't speak to why it's just now happening. I think it, there's been conversations before, and I believe people have brought this forward before. Um, but, you know, a little, it takes a little bit longer to get through the legislatures and different legislatures, different general assemblies come together. Uh, some are more receptive than others. Uh, but you know what? This was a game changer. When you got these phones, this really is a game changer. Everybody sees everything on video. So you always got to watch what you do now anyway. Okay, so you're just in your apartment right now, so you may be safe, but when you get outside, you know, someone could be recording you and you don't know. It's much more acceptable now than it has ever been. And I, I have to say that um, even though it's taken a while to get to this point, now we're at this point and it's time for us to get this thing done and make sure that uh, all of these, um, that all of these uh, interrogations are being uh, videotaped or, or audio taped. Yeah, and another reason is, as a sheriff, I had 450 employees. We had the largest police department in Montgomery County, even larger than the Dayton Police Department, and we did it at the sheriff's office because I mandated it. So I figured if I can do it with that large of an agency, everybody should be able to do it. And like Rep. West said, we all have phones. The technology is cheap now. There's no excuse that the police departments can't afford it because you can record it on your phone, upload it to your computer. So cost is no longer an excuse. So they can, they can get rid of that. Excuse. One thing just to clarify, under former Ohio law, uh, there was a provision that had an incentive that said if law enforcement did record an interrogation, the statements made during the interrogation would be presumed to have been made voluntarily. And that law was in effect for almost 10 years. But there were two problems with it. One was that it was not required universally across the state. So law enforcement leaders like Representative Plummer, when he was the sheriff, had that policy in place and used it. 
but only about half of the departments in Ohio ultimately had a policy in place. So we had uneven justice, depending on where you were, uneven practices. But the bigger issue and the reason we went to the legislature with this bill a couple of years ago is the Ohio Supreme Court struck down that incentive in the former law, not the law we have now, as unconstitutional. And the reason they did that was um, the Constitution requires that the government always establish that someone's statements were made knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily. So the law was well-intentioned, but ultimately it violated the Constitution. The Supreme Court of Ohio struck down the bill, uh, or struck down that part of the bill, uh, as it applied to juveniles in a horrible case coming out of Cincinnati, it was a juvenile homicide case. And so we thought that there was still value in the law. The law that is being um, discussed here tonight has the mandate, but it doesn't have the incentive that was unconstitutional. So this time we'll get it right, hopefully, and have it enacted into law by the end of the year. So here's a question for all of you. If you want to see a bill like this passed, um, how can you participate? You could, you could participate by calling the uh, Senate president, asking him, when are we going to hear this on the floor? When are we going to get this bill passed? You can send something to the, um, the chairman of the government, state government committee in the Senate and say you'd like to see this bill move forward. What does that do? Your, your voice helps push our bill forward. Does that make sense? Because right now, this is an election year. So everybody's on the ballot and everybody wants to please constituents, right? You are our constituents. So by sending letters to them saying, why you feel it's so important to get this bill passed or get this bill moving and get this bill done. Ask those very questions. Why has it taken so long to get this done? Uh, are good legitimate questions and it shows your concern and it shows your involvement. So I'll shut up. Laura, last question. Uh, yeah. Uh, Representative Plummer kind of touched on it with the cost, which isn't really an issue any longer. But are there any arguments against passing the bill? Uh, the student said, I generally can't think of any, yet around 25 states haven't passed this bill. I can't speak to those 25 states. I will say that this bill is the result of a lot of discussion with all kind of stakeholders in this area. We did reach out to the Buckeye Sheriff's Association, which is the largest law enforcement organization for sheriffs in Ohio. And remember how big Ohio is and how many parts of the state really rely on sheriff's departments, who often are underfunded just as our police agencies are. Uh, we worked with the uh, Police Chiefs Association in Ohio. And that's actually why the bill would only require audio recording rather than both audio and visual. Audio visual is fine, but in some of the more rural jurisdictions where you may have only one deputy trying to cover 400 square miles at a time, part of the concern was about the expense in those departments and if you have to have video equipment, it usually requires two people to operate it properly. So that's why this is an audio uh, only recording bill. Let me, let me also just say this last thing, I guess, with when it comes down to um, the interrogations and specifically of, of, of African-Americans. You know, I think when you have, um, audio or visual taping, you know, in the African American community, a lot of us don't even trust the system at all. Okay. But even though we will call if somebody is robbing our house, right? These police officers 
are working sometimes two and three jobs. They don't make a lot of money. Let me say that again. They don't make a lot of money. And they're going out to some of the most horrific things that you'll see in the streets, right? And they've already got off their second job. Now they're clean, doing the midnight shift uh, on the police department. Um, we have to address that issue with our police officers, either paying them more money so that they can work one job and be fine with that and adequate enough. So then when they're out, their, their memory is a little bit clearer. And then you have the African-American community and some of those other communities that's often victimized by a lot of these tired officers or you know, that have some bias. Uh, all sometimes that ends up showing up in reports, okay? Our system would be so much better if we had this in place. And yes, we should have been had this in place. But now that we didn't, now it's time to do it. Uh, so I'll just shut up with that and ask you all to continue to uh, broaden your minds and get involved uh, in Innocent Project as well as in criminal justice reform and speak your mind, speak your truth. And, you know, don't just be one issue oriented person. Look at the totality and, and, and go from that perspective. Let me shut up. Go ahead, Pierce or doctor. Representative Plummer, do you have anything you want to say in closing? Yeah, I mean, like I said, myself and Rep West work well together and we're going to continue that next General Assembly. Our new Senate president's very, very big in criminal justice reform. So we, we already discussed dealing with collateral sanctions. That's when you get charged with a crime. After that, you can't have certain jobs. Well, we're going to lift a lot of these collateral sanctions. So people that want to turn their lives around can turn their lives around. You know, if you can't get out and get a job, you're going to go back to the streets and you're going to do what you're good at, committing crimes. That's how people survive. They got to eat. So there's going to be a lot of good changes come next General Assembly, the next couple of years. And we just ask you guys, if you have any input on it, reach out to us. Um, you know, here's, the, here's one reason I left the sheriff's office. Our jails are full. 40% of our jails are full of people with mental illnesses. Shouldn't be in jail. 50% right. of our jails are full of people with drug abuse issues shouldn't be in jail. They should be in proper treatment centers. So 90% of my jail was full with those two issues. Very little room for criminals. So we got to change this system or we're going to keep getting what we get. You know, prison's full. We can't put anybody in prison. Nobody's getting any treatment. And it's just, we're chasing our tails. So after 30 years of working very hard at a profession, and it seems like things are getting worse, that tells me one thing, we need reform. I'm not talking about reform where everybody gets smacked on the hand and let go. If you do the crime, you're going to be held accountable. If you have to go to prison, you go to prison. But we've got to work on the back end and seal records, get people back into the workforce, and let them live the American dream that you all want to live by going to college and educating yourselves. I was thinking about something that uh, Representative Plummer just addressed. A number of exonerees suffer from severe PTSD and it makes it very difficult for them to reintegrate into society, even though they were taken away from their families and their lives through no fault of their own. Um, so I think, you know, mentioning if we want people to lead productive lives, um, once they've served their time, I am all in favor of having services for parolees and for people who have paid their debt to society. And I think we need to do everything possible to encourage them to be successful citizens. But how much more so do we owe to exonerees who never should have been in prison in the first place? And it's very clear that across the board, exonerees get fewer services, have fewer resources available to them than parolees. And that's just fundamentally unfair. Um, someone who, who, who did make a mistake, who committed a crime, who served their time and is out should have all possible resources to help them get on the straight and narrow and live a productive life. But we take that to the nth degree when it comes to exonerees who weren't even guilty in the first place and never should have been in prison. And yet they have fewer resources and supports. So I think that should be part of our discussion as well. Maybe we'll be back next year with a new bill with these fine representatives leading the charge. No good deed goes unpunished, as you probably have found out in the legislature. Well, thank you all again for joining us. Um, 
Again, thank you to the University of Dayton, particularly to Dr. Barry, Laura, and Claudia. Excellent way to start off uh, Wrongful Conviction Month. It's coming up in October. But especially a thank you to Representative Plummer and Representative West. Um, if you knew me better, you would know that I don't really like people all that much, but these two guys um, give me a lot of hope for the government. We all have our own political viewpoints, and I think sometimes we stereotype based on our viewpoints, uh, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. These are two leaders that you can have a lot of faith in, regardless of where you live. You are very fortunate to have them in the Ohio House of Representatives. Uh, so do your part as well. Make sure, especially this year, that you take your time and be informed during the election. Aside from your representatives who will be on the ballot, you may have the opportunity to vote for your county prosecutor, and you certainly will have your opportunity to vote for judges, including two justices out of the seven on the Ohio Supreme Court. I don't know that it's ever a great idea just to um, look for party affiliation, but that's your prerogative as a citizen. Just be mindful in Ohio, in November, we pretend like judicial elections are not partisan. So your ballot for your Supreme Court justices and your local judges will not have party identification with them. I know it's hard to ask you to do something more, but please take your time not just to vote, but be informed as you vote. And remember that you do have elected officials like Representative West and Representative Plummer. Uh, they're the kind of people that you can feel good about no matter where you live or which party you subscribe to. So thank you all. Have a good night. Stay safe. And again, thank you to Representatives Plummer and West for their service and for taking time with us tonight. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Study hard. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Pierce. <laughs> Thanks.